Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, another Boomer Tech uh, lecture. Um, my name is Ambrose Ferber. I'm the Associate Director of Technology here at Santa Fe Prep, as well as the uh, Chair of the Technology and Engineering Department. And I have been uh, working with Anne and Villages of Santa Fe now for, uh, I think it's like seven years or something that we've been doing this program here at Prep. And uh, I'm speaking to you now from my classroom here on campus. And uh, today we're gonna be talking about uh, AI, artificial intelligence by, by popular demand. Um, and uh, so just a couple of other like little housekeeping things. I will be trying to watch for uh, raised hands in the uh, Zoom interface. Um, Anne will also be kind of looking for that and she will let me know if there's a question, feel free to interrupt at any time to ask a question or to get some clarification or anything like that. Um, and uh, you can also just put stuff in the in the chat area. I will be trying to watch that and Anne will be trying to watch that. And uh, so if I see those things there, I will stop and address that. We'll also have a question and answer period at the end if you want to save your questions for then. And um, and uh, as Anne has just said, this presentation will be on where this is being recorded right now. This will be posted to YouTube. We'll also be sending out the presentation that I'll be working from here. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to read this pretty well. If you're on full screen, this should be pretty legible. And I'll just be and I'll be going through it, too, of course. So um, I guess uh, really quickly, any other quick questions about sort of logistical things before we get started? here uh, hoping that everybody can hear me okay and can see me okay um i guess like if i could just get a little thumbs up from people that audio is good and that visuals are good and all of that cool all right that sounds great thank you very much um so what we're going to be talking about today is ai um, we're going to go through a little bit of um, what it is, how it works, and how to use it. This is by no means going to be a comprehensive uh, deep dive into the technology because I don't, I can't imagine that's what anybody wants. But if you are interested in learning more about sort of the the deeper parts of it and everything, then uh, just let us know, and I'd be happy to. Um, I'd be happy to get with you and talk to you some more about it. But also there are a lot of amazing resources, everything from technical white papers to uh, like quick and dirty rundowns online. So um, search would be your friend if you, if you want to find out more. But let's jump into it. I've titled this AI Ain't Intelligent, at least not as intelligent as you think. As we're going to see here, um, it, it may be slightly different from what you are expecting. And in fact, it's important to understand that artificial intelligence has been around for a long time. And in fact, you are already using AI to a certain, or at least most of you have probably encountered and used AI quite a bit over the last decade even. Um, everything from your Netflix uh, recommended list, the algorithm that chooses things for you to watch on Netflix or Hulu or on YouTube or on Instagram or on TikTok, um, there is a sort of artificial intelligence underlying that that's trying to figure out what you want to see and give you that because that's, of course, in their commercial best interest to do that. The uh, purchases that you make on Amazon, Amazon, of course, also has an algorithm that they use to to try to uh, find stuff that you want to buy because again, that's their commercial interest. There have also been, you may have seen some uh, chat bots out there over the years. There's been a few different ones um, that are fairly crude, fairly predictable. Like it's pretty easy to tell after just a little while that you're not talking to a real person. Recently, there were some that, um, kind of soft. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with the Turing test, but Alan Turing was a computer scientist in the middle of the 20th century. And uh, he proposed this idea 
that um, a person who was interfacing with a computer from a different room where they so they couldn't see uh, they were interfacing with a computer and a couple of human subjects would be in they would not be able to tell the difference between the interactions between the three and that that would be an indication of artificial intelligence. Um, that idea has sort of been debunked, but there were a couple of chatbots that sort of kind of passed the Bechdel test um, a few years ago. Um, sorry, not the Bechdel test, the Turing test. And um, but they but, but even then they were not great. They were not perfect. But recently, you, I'm sure you have noticed that recently there has been this major furor over uh, AI. And like, so clearly something has changed because now everybody's talking about AI, everybody's doing all this stuff now, and there's all these new products and it's like big. So what changed? What's different about what has happened now in the last couple of years that really changed the landscape? And well, there are some new technologies out there um, that have completely changed everything. And they're not that new. They've been under development and being worked on. They have been being worked on for quite a few years now, but they have now entered the mainstream. They're now available for, for public use. And you may have seen some of these things. These are more enterprise and industrial applications. Uh, C3 is like a marketing and e-commerce thing that analyzes your data. Um, and it should be noted too. Um, it's important to note that AI has been around for a long time, also in like data analysis stuff where people can feed really big, huge problems to an AI and the AI can sort through all the data and sort of find patterns and return some data. Um, but what's, and, and then, and so some of these other companies have started using that more to uh, lender toolkit, which analyzes uh, somebody's credit worthiness for, uh, for borrowing money um, by using a whole bunch of different factors that used to be human and now an AI can sort of analyze it. Uh, Cemento is like marketing, market research stuff. Uh, actually, there's some great health things that will, so like you can hand it like a huge pile of uh, data of like um, all kinds of different tests and blood tests and urinalysis and um, check all these genetic markers. And uh, we can diagnose or predict health problems in people um, with pretty good accuracy using AI much faster, like detecting cancers way earlier so that they can be dealt with. Um, and so that kind of stuff, that's been around for a little while. It's now, you know, sort of exploded and become a much bigger deal. But what I think everyone on this Zoom probably cares the most about, because it's stuff that you can use, and it's why this has suddenly become this thing, this major thing in the zeitgeist that everybody's talking about right now, and that is generative AI. The idea behind generative AI is, is that it's an AI that focuses on original content creation. And when we talk about content creation, that can be everything from music to uh, visual arts, to poetry, to essays, to video, to all sorts of different kinds of things, visual, written, audio, all this stuff that can be created by an AI that is now in everyone's toolkit. Everybody who has internet access can now get online, access tools that will create these things and um, be able to, to wield them as a tool. Now, of course, we do have to be careful because obviously there are a lot of potential hazards, a lot of potential problems with this stuff, as you can imagine. Um, and we'll get, we'll dig a little bit deeper into the sort of like gotchas, the cons, the, the things that might be problematic with this technology a little bit later on in this lecture. But I'm sure you already are sort of thinking about these things like copyright and uh, you know legal access and what, it, what does it do to uh, a creative content creator, human creative content creators and all sorts of things like that. Not to mention all of the disinformation that we can uh, expect from this kind of technology. We'll talk more 
about that in a little bit. Um, but for right now, that's the idea behind generative AI is, is that we can actually create this content. It's not just using a computer to you know, hand off a whole bunch of data and have it be able to process all that and give you some analysis on that or figure things out. AI is fantastic at that. And now it's starting to get very good at this. So um, I actually gave this a little bit of a prompt. Um, I went on chat GPT, um, which we will talk a little bit more about. And I gave it a prompt that says, uh, write a sonnet that helps senior citizens understand generative AI. That was the prompt I gave it. Here's the sonnet it wrote. In twilight's grace, where wisdom finds its seat, we ponder marvels, mysteries profound. In whispers soft, the winds of change shall greet as generative minds in silence abound. What sorcery is this, they oft inquire, where thoughts take flight, in circuits they reside. No quill, no parchment, nor ink's gentle fire, yet tales unfold with endless worlds to guide. Tis not the magic of a wizard's hand, nor potion brewed in alchemists' deep lair, but minds of silicone they understand, to craft new realms with calculations rare. So fear not, elder souls, this brave new age, for in its heart lies wisdom, not mere rage. <laughs> that was written by a generative AI, by ChatGPT. And honestly, that's pretty good. It's a little terrifying, in fact, how good that was. It got the prompt, it understood the some of the, in fact, if you'll note some of the nuance here about how, I didn't even say like for an audience that would be resistant to AI, for an audience that would sort of like be mistrusting of it. And yet it kind of understood that to be the job and it addressed some of those issues. Uh, let's see, we've got some comments here. Let me just check. Oh, just how cool. Yeah, right. Like it's a it's a pretty amazing sonnet. Um, all right. So uh, it's important to know that AI is here. It is fully 100 percent among us. It's being used. It's out there and you won't be able to fight it. You won't be able to resist it. And in fact, not only is it a fun and useful tool for you, um, but it is increasingly going to become a necessary part of interacting with the rest of the world. Um, most professionals in the next few years are going to have to know how to wield this technology. Just like it would be pretty hard to find a, a, a job these days if you didn't know how to use email or you didn't know how to use a web browser, um, AI is going to be a part of that. And in fact, here at PrEP, we are addressing that as a faculty. Um, we have spent the last year really working towards that and trying to discover how we are going to, I mean, there's the obvious issue that students are undoubtedly already using it to write things and then passing that writing off as their own. And uh, I have a couple of students in the room here who are making funny faces at me. So, um, but, uh, Fortunately, I think, personally, I think that fortunately we are as a faculty as a whole, at least attempting to take the strategy not of just like cracking down on it and saying, no, you can't get down, and like trying to detect it and get kids in trouble for it. Like we're trying at least to um, embrace it and to lean into it and to teach it because this is a tool that these kids are going to need to have. And as the quote to the quotation I saw, I should have put it up here, but the quotation I saw that I thought was wonderful was AI is not going to take your job, but someone using AI is going to take your job. And I think that that's pretty accurate that without this as a tool in your toolkit, you are going to be at a disadvantage, not that using it to cheat is a way of uh, uh, avoiding the process of becoming whatever kind of person you want to become, but that you will need this as a tool. It'll become as ubiquitous as 
um, other job skills that we have. And, and the ship has said, like it is definitely deeply ingrained to many of the things that we wanna do. Here's another prompt that I gave the AI. Um, I, I got a class here, uh, it's called Makerspace currently. Um, and it's sort of like a, an engineering, uh, technology and engineering course. Um, we do a lot of making, we use a lot of the technologies. You probably can actually hear the 3D printers going right now um, and uh, laser cutting and Arduino microcontrollers and soldering, all this stuff. Uh, and I kind of don't want to call it makerspace anymore. Um, so I was thought, well, let me give this as a prompt, as a class that uses all these different tools to make things that focuses on engineering, but that really focuses on teaching failure. That's one of my big things as an educator is teaching how to fail. So I gave this as the prompt to uh, ChatGPT. And ChatGPT came back with a number of suggestions here, none of which um, did I like by itself. But this is where generative AI is actually probably the best used, at least right now, is not as a replacement for thoughtfulness or writing, or but as a starting place, as a way to brainstorm things during the pro the beginning of the process. Like there are some cool things down here, designing disasters, fail to succeed, kind of like that a lot. Um, and then, and actually mastering engineering through mistakes, not bad. I would probably tweak some of these things if I was going to actually use it as a, um, as, as, a uh, as an actual title for the course. So, but, Clearly, it, it understood the assignment and it developed some stuff. Oh, I've got a question here. How long did it AI to take? Oh, that, that, that is a good thing. Maybe we can actually, maybe I'll actually uh, put that up here and give you a little demonstration at some point. It's basically instantaneous. Like, like you, you write a thing and then it just puts it back. It takes almost no time at all for the text responses. We're going to look at some image responses. Those can take you know, maybe half a minute or so to generate, but um, but these are basically instant. It just comes right back with the reply. It is not like I send it off and then I like wait a couple of days to get a response or anything like that. It's very, very quick. Um, so yeah, here is another example, uh, maybe something that would be, uh, you know, and again, as a good place to start, something that you would want to modify. Um, and especially if you are not a particularly good writer. Um, so I actually really love writing things. Like I enjoy the process of writing. So I almost never use AI to just sort of like write stuff. Um, and uh, so here's a potential thing that you could use it for, again, as a starting place, to write a formal apology to a neighbor. Let's say you had a big rager at your house huge noise and craziness cops came and uh so and your neighbors are all uh upset about it so you want to write an email to a neighbor to apologize for it um so this is the prompt i gave it and again you just type this in one of the keys with uh ai with the generative ai especially the ones like chat gpt or gemini the other ones we're going to talk about um you just talk to them they work the best when you just speak in natural language. You don't try and guess anything, although learning how to be specific enough in your prompt is a good idea. Um, so write an email formally apologizing to a neighbor for that rager you threw. And here is the response. I'll read this out loud to you quickly here because it might be a little difficult on the screen here. Um, subject, sincere apologies for noise from recent gathering. Dear neighbor's name, Please accept my sincerest apologies for the noise generated by the gathering I hosted at my residence on date of party. I understand that the music and activity likely disturbed your peace and quiet, and for that, I am truly sorry. I was it was inconsiderate of me not to be more mindful of the potential disruption caused by the party, especially at time of party. I should have taken steps to ensure the noise level remained respectful for our neighbors. I value living in a peaceful community and having good relationships with those around me. I hope this incident hasn't caused any lasting inconvenience. If you'd like to discuss this further, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at your convenience. I'm happy to chat and explore ways to ensure such disruption doesn't occur again. 
Thank you for understanding sincerely your name. It's pretty good, right? Like, and I, again, like this could be a starting place, but this is pretty polished, right? This is, it's nice and formal, but it has that flavor of having been written by an actual person. Um, so yeah, let's take a look at another example. Um, Chat GPT, um, now if you pay for it, it used to be that you could do the image processing things for free as well, uh, but OpenAI, the company that makes Chat GPT has now closed off their DALL-E2, that was the product that does create, can create images, and instead they're using only DALL-E3, and DALL-E3 is rolled into Chat GPT4, which in order to access you have to pay for, which is like 20 bucks a month um, to access it. Um, so, uh, you can no longer mess around with this, but there are some others that I'm not as familiar with, um, that you can, uh, access for free. And, uh, we'll have some links to some of those things a little bit later on. Um, so this is the prompt I gave it just for fun. Uh, I am, uh, working with a group called Girls in STEM here at, uh, at PrEP and, uh, I had created a logo for them. But I thought for the purposes of this presentation, I would, if I were using ChatGPT um, or DAL-E, this is what I would do. So here's the prompt that I wrote for that. Create a colorful and whimsical logo in the style of Saul Bass. I don't know if there's any design nerds out there who know who Saul Bass is. For a nonprofit organization that works towards retaining girls in STEM fields in late elementary school into middle school. Okay, let's see what it came up with. And again, this took about... 20 seconds to process and then it gave me this uh and it gave it give, it does give you a little like rundown a little text rundown also of what it was thinking when it did it i don't know how saul bass this is this is not super saul bassian to me but it's also it's pretty good right like this is a pretty clean fun thing it's maybe a little bit complicated for a logo but again where these things excel is is as a starting place as a place to begin a place to get you some ideas and get you some mock-ups and some things to work with so that you're not just starting out from nothing so if i were going to use this i might modify it a little bit you can see there's some weirdness things i don't know if you can see that very well here like like some odd shape, like things that look sort of like a nucleus with electrons swimming, but not quite. But that might inspire me to be like, okay, I can make some adjustments. I can make some changes and give me a sense of where to go from here. Um, as, as a professional designer, this would save me a lot of time in the initial part, but wouldn't do the job for me. But it would get pretty close. I mean, I love this conceptual of this, girl sitting at a giant microscope like it was a desk like cool stuff that i might not have thought of and it is very whimsical and very colorful so then i added the uh um and one of the things that chat gpt and all the others can do is you're having a conversation with it it's sort of like a back and forth so it gave me this image and then told me it's thinking like that it features elements symbolic of STEM, like gears, microscopes, and mathematical symbols. Um, and let me know what you think and if there's anything you can add. So then I, I, I said to it, okay, great. Can you add the text girls in STEM to the logo? And here's what I got back. Now you can see where some of the real failings, at least for now, happen with AI image processing. One of the things it does not do very well is text in images. I have yet to see it really get that. And, and remember, the, what we're going to dig in in a minute. We're going to dig into how this works, like what, what it's actually doing under the hood, which is fascinating. So, um, but, but, and then we'll see sort of like maybe why it has a hard time doing things like that. You can see it completely butchered the stem i mean I'm ready, and then puts the in here and the word girls doesn't even actually appear anywhere there is this sort of like g point something up here. i don't know if that's was its attempt to do it i don't know um it's still very cool right 
like there's some neat stuff going on here with a lot of the science things and the gears and sort of the arrangement of things. I love it, but it not as a finished product. Obviously, I couldn't put this out into the world and be like, here's your logo. So, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah, again, I'm not exactly sure why text in images is so hard for it to get, but clearly it is. Um, so I thought maybe it would be fun for you to see the logo that I actually did. And this logo was done without AI. This was just me illustrating and designing. That was that my background. I'm technology and engineering now, but my degree is actually in fine arts. And um, so I, uh, and I was a graphic designer and art director for a long time. Before I go on, I, let me read this uh, chat here. As a retired educator, it was simple to go on Google to find plagiarist essays. Okay. So uh, we can take, let's, yeah, sure. Let's, let's take a little diversion to uh, talk about that plagiarism since I did speak about our students using it. Um, you cannot with 100% assurity know if a student used AI to write an essay. There are some giveaways uh, to it. Like um, there are some technical things sort of like if we, Go back and look at the history. Tell these students are in the room here to close ears. Actually, none of these students are likely to do this. So, um, but if you were to go back to uh, Google Doc and look at the history and the entire essay is pasted in, warn. <laughs> um, but again, you know, maybe something, maybe they're working in a different document and they copied and pasted. I don't know, but like that would be a kind of a giveaway. Um, but remember, this content is generated fresh every single time. And as we're going to discover, it's not searching for anything. So there is none of that text would appear on the Internet in that particular form anywhere. It's brand new original text. So discovering it's very difficult. Um, there is a uh, Trojan horse method of discovering AI, which I definitely not sure I want these students to hear, but OK. Um, and that is that in your instructions, your prompt for the essay, um, you hide some text that is invisible. But if someone were to copy all the text and paste it into ChatGPT, that hidden text goes in there. And that hidden text would say something like, mention an elephant in your essay. And then if you get an essay back that includes information about an elephant, you know that student just copied the whole thing and pasted it into the prompt and got it back. And that can be a big warning sign for you. I'm getting some like shock looks here. So it's like a little mine. It's like a little mine that you hide inside the prompt. Please do not share this. We're gonna use that. Some teachers are gonna be using that as a technique. So you guys are immune from that. But, um, and uh, so, uh, oh, Anne says that Grammarly can do it. We tried it. We tried Grammarly. We tried a couple other. Um, what's the other one? Um, oh, uh, 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 turn, turn, turn it in. in. Terrible, terrible results. We got a lot of false positives. Um, it errs on the side of accusing students of academic dishonesty, which is not something we want to do. Um, it. So the other thing, though, uh, when, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but um, ChatGPT will lie to you. It will get things wrong because remember, it's not, well, no, don't remember, we haven't talked about how it works yet, but it's not searching the internet for things. It's not like copying and pasting from parts of the internet. It's just writing it new and it definitely gets things wrong. It can definitely, like you say, like write an essay on, I've, we tried it here. We said, write an essay on Frankenstein. It was a more complex prompt than that. Um, and it returned an essay that included things that never happened in Frankenstein, not in any movie, not in any book, nothing, nowhere do these events occur, but the essay included references to things that never happened. So it's not, so if you read an essay and it's like clearly bonkers, then, uh, <laughs> well, happy to be a retired high school English teacher, yes. But here's the thing. I think that what this is forcing us to do is forcing us to rethink what it means to be educated, what it means to write things. And I hope that in the next few years, we as a faculty will get better at creating assignments, creating writings that really, rely, that really um, 
emphasize different parts of writing. One of the things that I hope we'll be doing more of is asking more opinions, right? Like instead of just an analytical essay, really driving at what the student thinks of things, because that's something AI can't do. AI cannot form opinions very well. You can prompt it to, and it will sort of make a half-baked attempt at it, but it does not write opinions very well. Um, I think more in-class writing. I think um, uh, having more thoughtful prompts will help us to make sure that students are doing their own writing. But also, I think letting students use AI, say, hey, this is a tool that you have at your disposal. Use it. Write your outline with it. Use it to get some thoughts. Use it to fix some of your grammar and spelling, which are universally atrocious, right? Like, use it to help you. And if we lean into it that way, I think, I hope, students will respond. The other tack that I've been taking with my own students, which it's hard, hard to know if it's working because it's kind of like a really long-term game, is making it clear to them that at some point they have to decide what kind of person they want to be, who they want to be. Do they want to be an educated person or not? And at some point, like they, they could probably, I even tell this to them, you could probably use ChatGPT the rest of your high school and graduate without ever writing another thing yourself. If you were clever with it, you probably could do it and not get caught. But someday you're going to be standing up in front of a group of people and you're going to need to defend your position on something and you're not going to be able to do it. Someday you are going to, if you're doing something interesting with your life, someday you're going to need those skills and you won't have them and you have to decide what kind of person you want to be. So, but it's a difficult thing. Um, it, it is, yeah, and uh, Anne is pointing out it's a turning point, much like calculators, right? Like there was a time when, you know, pre-calculator, everybody had to do their arithmetic and then it came and, and now we allow calculators in most testing because it's like, whatever, like, okay, it's this tool, everyone has them, they're everywhere. And like, wouldn't it suck to get a bad grade on something because you made a, mis a simple mistake in arithmetic that you know you can do, but you got the concept right, but you just messed up a little thing in, in the arithmetic and you got, that would be a shame, right? We wanna focus on a bigger picture. So anyway, nice diversion, thank you. Um, so uh, again, my degree is in fine arts as a designer. So uh, with Girls in STEM, I created a logo. Uh, so a little bit nervously, I'm gonna present to you the logo I made without the help of AI. And there it is, which uh, was intended to appeal to a uh, like a late elementary school girl primarily and to have that sense of whimsy and lots of color and still include a lot of sort of abstract elements of STEM across the board. We wanted to make sure that it like incorporated all different flavors of STEM stuff. So that is my very illustrative, very brightly colored sort of a pay on to early 90s, like late 80s, early 90s color schemes and stuff, which is kind of coming back. Anyway, so how, though, are these things being generated? Like we saw with astonishment how incredible that sonnet was, for instance, how incredible that email was that it's able to just sort of do these things. How is it doing it? Well, to help us understand what it's doing. Let's first look at a little couple things of what it's not doing. It's not just search. It's not just sort of like a fancy search. It's not just like going out and searching things and grabbing them. In fact, ChatGPT, one of OpenAI's rules with ChatGPT was that it's not allowed to search. It's not allowed to, when you give it a prompt, it's not allowed to go out and access the internet and get new information. All it can have is what, is what is what it started with, which was a lot, granted, and what it learns by interacting with people. So every time you interact with ChatGPT, it is attempting to learn new things from that. And most of the sort of mainstream um, out there, modern AIs like Chat, excuse me, like ChatGPT work that way, where they're not even allowed to search. It's also 
important to note that right now, um, AI is not really trying to create synthetic humans either. The interactions are intended to be very humanistic, intended to be very conversational, um, so that when you when it responds to you, it's intended to sound like natural language. But at least right now, at this time, nobody's really working on trying to create something intended to fool people into thinking that it's a human, intending to think in the way that a human thinks. Although, we're gonna we're gonna kind of blur that line a little bit, I think, and uh, there may be some surprises for all of us in store in the coming years. But for right now, this is not the goal, and we're not here yet. We're not at the point of like androids walking around, talking and looking like humans. But yet, I learned a long time ago in technology to never say never, right? To never ever make predictions like, oh, well, we'll never, we'll never, no one will ever, right? Like famously president of IBM in the 60s saying that like, there will never be a need for more than 12 computers in the world. Uh, Bill Gates saying in the early 80s, I think, um, that no computer will ever need more than 640 kilobytes of RAM. I mean, like, like all these things that clearly, because they just, they had no vision of it. And it's not to say I can say it will or won't. It's that with technology, it's impossible to see into the future. But generative AI right now is built on a foundation called a large language model. There are some, uh, some other foundations that kind of get built on top of the large language model that are like really for specialty applications. Um, like machine learning, deep learning, NLP, the natural language processing, computer vision, where the computer can actually like see stuff and process things that it's taking in as visual information, um, that kind of that kind of thing. These other things, machine learning and deep learning, are uh, really just like structured ways of a computer's way of sort of like processing information. But you don't really need to know all of that in any kind of detail whatsoever. What it really boils down to, this large language model, what it boils down to is that a computer is fed huge amounts of data, right? We, can, can, we get it to consume this huge amount of data. By the way, this is an AI-generated image I made for this presentation. My prompt was create a color illustration that depicts the process of large language of a large language model such as yourself consuming data in order to learn. And this is what it returned to me, which I think is pretty great. This was even just the first one, the first response it gave me. And I was like, cool, all right. And also I just thought you would like to see sort of the way this works. And uh, bless you, it's not, I, again, this is a finished product. And there are a lot of things that make me uncomfortable about this, right? And a lot of things that should probably make you uncomfortable about all of this. Um, and we'll we'll touch on that a little bit more later, but think about like all of this stuff that it consumed, all of the things and where all of this came from. All of the things it consumed came from human authors and human artists and human designers and human philosophers and human scientists and human typographers and whatever, right? They all came from a bunch of humans, made all this stuff that it consumed. And there are a lot of big questions right now about this process, right? Like, does OpenAI, the company that makes ChatGPT and Dolly, but what right did they have to give all this to their machine? And then when I say, write me, and I didn't, but like, you can say, write me a poem in the style of Edgar Allan Poe. Write me something in the style, style of David Badalci, right? Like, I could say anything like that, and it would attempt to do that. And in fact, there have been a lot of legal challenges to this. Um, uh, George R. R. Martin was recently uh, because somebody wrote something in AI in his style, and he was like, you can't do that because like it takes... 
And yeah, I get that, right? Like, it's not, so, I mean, first of all, I didn't hire a designer or illustrator to do this. I just like did it with a computer and it returned something. So yeah, we're like taking work away possibly from creatives, although I wouldn't have hired a designer to do this. Like that would have been crazy for a presentation like this one. But not only that, but it's that the basis of this entire thing comes from the work of other people. One of the things that chat, uh, all of the generative AIs can do is they can write code for you can say like, I need to say, and in fact, um, I'm no longer a working code professional, but I still have a lot of friends and colleagues who are still working professional. All of them are using AI to write pieces of their code. Like none of them are just sitting and writing code, but like we've all been using libraries and things for a long time anyway. And so I don't, I don't know exactly what, well, the way that it writes code is by having analyzed the code that was written by humans, right? So is that, that okay? Is that all right that it read all that stuff, that it read all the works of all of these authors and is now using that to generate its stuff? And at first blush, it seems sort of like, well, no, like these guys had no right to that. But then again, all of us, if part of the idea is, is that we are sort of creating this artificial intelligence and eventually maybe getting to that point of it being like a human intelligence, how is that any different from the rest of us? It's sort of like saying, I'm not allowed to write any fiction because I've read fiction. It's sort of like saying, I'm not allowed to write code because um, I learned from people who taught me how to write code, who wrote that code first. We all, as humans, learn how to do things by consuming things. And this is really no different. These were all public works that were there and that people learned from. This AI is the summation of its experience, just like all of us humans are summations of our experience. And you could argue, of course, that this is a company profiting from that. And that's a good argument. I don't really have a great counter argument, except that like, I got paid to do things professionally that I learned to do by my experience by consuming other things. I don't exactly know how this is gonna play out from a legal standpoint. I don't know where the endpoint is. I don't know how these legal challenges are going to shake out, but it's a very interesting question being posed right now. And something that's very difficult for all of us to understand and again this is out there right this is going i don't know that we can put this back in the box and that no one's ever going to be using ai in five years right i don't think that can possibly happen at this point um so back to the process of ai right so the first step is that this large language model consumes all this data and they basically fed it the internet plus a bunch of other like open source software and they fed it um uh, uh, uh works in the public domain and they just they fed it everything they could possibly think of to feed it then the large language model processes all that data and it does so using the tools we talked about before those deep learning things the machine learning and deep learning algorithms um there's a thing called a neural net which is sort of a way for a computer to be able to learn by seeing lots and lots and lots of the same thing and analyzing the, it in different ways and attempting to find all of the different endpoints. And we don't have time or the bandwidth to really talk about like the complexities and details of how a neural net works, but using all of these tools, these machine learning tools, this large language model takes everything it consumed and processes it and puts it into um, it's not quite like a database, but you could sort of think of it as a database. It just has all of this processed information using those tools that it has at its disposal. The prompt for this image, uh, again, on Dolly 3 from ChatGPT4 was, can you create a companion illustration? Remember, I wanted it to be related to the previous illustration. I want a companion to this. Can you create a companion illustration to the last one that shows the AI processing all that information it ate? And this is the image it came up with. Again, like pretty great. <laughs> like 
Like, I love that illustration. Look how thoughtful this computer looks, right? So then the third step, the big step, is this step, prediction. It takes all that analysis, all that data it consumed, and it attempts, when given a prompt of some kind, to just predict the next word, right? It starts with a thing, and based off of its experience, with everything it has learned so far, it thinks, well, this is probably the most likely thing. Given all this context, this is the most likely next word. And then the word after that, oh, this is the next most likely word. And it's just trying to predict all of that. Um, just for um, your own edification, if you really care about some of the technology, this, LLMs, the large language models, are built off of a uh, deep learning, uh, a, a type of neural network that's called a transformer model. Um, and that's sort of the engine by which all of this prediction happens. But that's all it's doing, which is kind of crazy, honestly. What are some things that you can use? Well, uh, I've included a uh, link here, the, the uh, invitation to this lecture uh, Anne had included a link that was like 34 uh, AI tools to use. I've relinked it here in this presentation. Uh, it's a great resource to just like go through and look at some stuff. Some curated ones, the ones that I have the most experience with are these four. Oops. These four here are the ones that I have personally have the most experience with and can speak to the most. Obviously, ChatGPT. Um, and this was uh, OpenAI's project that they've been working on for a long time, um, but has really kind of come to the fore in the last couple of years. Um, and uh, Gemini is Google's product, which used to be called Bard, um, but they changed the name to Gemini, I'm not sure why. Um, and uh, it was, uh, and it's very similar to ChatGPT, gives a lot of similar kinds of conversational responses to things. Um, I tend to like Gemini more for writing code which is probably not useful to most people on this call, but maybe somebody. Um, and then uh, Claude is actually from this company called Anthropic, which um, Claude is especially good for writing like essays and uh, like creative nonfiction or creative writing things. Like it's really good. It's kind of more of the... Uh, a uh, tweed jacket with leather patches on the sleeves of the AIs. It, Claude spends its time in a coffee shop, <laughs> whereas ChatGPT and Gemini spend their time like in a lab. That's sort of like how I feel about the difference the between them. What? Who's in the bar? Who's in the bar? <laughs> Actually, I think ChatGPT is in a bar. Gemini's in a lab and Claude is in a Parisian coffee shop on a rainy day. Claude does its stuff with a typewriter instead of with a keyboard and computer. So, so, <clears throat> um, but all three of those are pretty similar. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with image processing stuff except for DALI, which is an open AI, the same company that makes ChatGPT, open AI. They also make a product called Dolly, and that's the one I'm most familiar with for image processing things. And again, you can't access Dolly anymore unless you have, um, unless you're paying for ChatGPT4. Um, <clears throat> the last one here is a really interesting one. It's sort of in its own category. It's called Google Notebook, um, and it's still experimental. It's still in the Google Labs sphere, but if you have a personal and the only way to access it, if you have a personal Gmail account, you cannot use a Gmail account that's associated with a with an organization like an enterprise or a um, <clears throat> uh, or school or anything like that. But a personal Gmail account, you can access this somewhat experimental Google notebook, um, which really it's it's a very different product from the others. It has kind of a very specific goal. The idea behind that one is that you feed it your own documents. So the example that we used here that was pretty cool is, uh, so we have a student handbook here at the school and uh, we have a PDF of the student handbook. And uh, so we fed it the PDF of that student handbook. 
And then we could ask questions about it. We said, give us a summary of the cell phone policy. And Notebook went through and grabbed a bunch of sailing information that was in a couple of different places in the handbook and gave us this like brilliant, short, pithy little sum summation of the cell phone use policy. Um, so it can, and so its idea is that it's really helping you to sort of like take your own documents and then do stuff with your own documents, creating all kinds of other things from it. Um, it does smart indexing and smart table of contents stuff. Like it does some really interesting, cool things. Again, it's still pretty experimental, but uh, but well worth looking. Um, is IBM doing anything with Watson? Yes, IBM is doing things with Watson. Um, I don't. Yeah, I, Watson was sort of like way early. Like that was a while ago now. I want to tell you, it's like 15 years ago, something like that, that Watson first appeared. And Watson was on Jeopardy and like did quite well on Jeopardy. They didn't let it access the internet. Again, like that was an important thing. You couldn't just search up the answers. It had to sort of process the answers. And it did really, really well. And Watson was solving some really cool, interesting problems for people. And IBM is doing things with Watson, but again, more in that enterprise data analysis sphere. Um, I don't think there's sort of like a free public face of Watson. I could be wrong about that. I, that's not one that I use very often. Like I said, I actually don't use these tools as much as I should. I should be using them more, I think. But like, I still enjoy writing. So, you know, um, I do, and I don't think that, but just because I enjoy writing, just because I enjoy designing, it's not a reason to not use these tools. Again, it's like another thing in your quiver. It's sort of like saying, well, you can't be a real writer unless you you know, write everything longhand and then have someone else type it for you, right? Like, like, okay, we have computers and we can do the typing ourselves. Even if you, even though the longhand process does do something in the brain and activate something else, right? Like we have these tools at our disposal to do good things. Um, how the, will this translate into use by the medical profession? Yeah, um, it's huge. In fact, um, there's been some speculation that AI will be sort of a great equalizer um, that is that because it will allow people to become to, to, to do things like, let's say, in medicine and in law that would have otherwise required huge amounts of education that a lot of people simply don't have the resources to access. But now with AI sort of like being able to do a lot of analysis for you, both in like taking tests results and analyzing them for you to being able to find things in textbooks or find things in other resources and like deliver quick information and create lines between things. Probably doctors may in the future be more like, um, you know, some kind of computer data operator rather than somebody who's cut people open in school. Um, so I, yeah, I, and, and the data analysis part, like I said before, I've seen a bunch of stuff where like, cancer detection way earlier as a result of of all of this um so i think that in the medical profession it's going to be incredibly useful and even for doctors even for trained physicians or or nps or cna or sorry uh uh, uh physicians assistants um like the ability to access the association of different kinds of materials and being able to synthesize those into a single thing will become incredibly useful for uh, for those professionals, even though they are um, uh, even though they are still also themselves trained as humans. The other thing that the AI will not be able to do very well is, at least not for a long time, is sit in a room and comfort somebody who just got told they have cancer, right? Like that may become more of the job is the person who tells the family that they just lost a loved one and deals with that in a more human personal way. Whereas the actual data and knowledge and all that stuff can be taken care of by computers. Maybe this is a good thing. Maybe it's a way for humans to be more in touch with their humanity um, instead of just obsessed with the acquisition of knowledge. 
I'm not sure. Something that's interesting to note about all of these is that, uh, so, and there are a ton of products out there. And the best way for you to learn how to use them is to start playing with them. You can just sign up. All of these are, are you are, it's easy. You can just get on and you log in, create an account. And most, all of them for free. There's stuff you can do for free. There's other things you have to do to, that you have to pay for to like sort of unlock more advanced features, but like just get in and start playing with it. Start using it when you have something you need to write or something you're trying to think of, something you're trying to brainstorm. Try, try using one of these as a starting place and just see how it goes. There are a lot of other products I'm sure you will see now with AI and uses AI to do this. The vast majority of those other products that are using AI are built on one of these other engines. In fact, most of them are built on ChatGPT. One of the ways that OpenAI makes its most most of its money is by unlocking what's called uh, an API, uh, application programmer interface, doesn't really matter. But the idea is, is that another company can access the tools that ChatGPT has built to like use those tools for their own purposes. So like you've probably seen ads for Wix and Squarespace, and I think those are the ones that are, it's like website building that's all powered by AI. So the idea is, is that you um, you can get on and be like, here's the thing I want to sell. And it'll come up with like a name and a domain and start building the website. And it'll even write like body copy for you for all the different products you have, <laughs> like, right? Like it's, that, that's all built on ChatGPT. Like they're just leveraging the ChatGPT technology for that. So um, don't be put off too much by the huge amount of different products and services that are out there, you know, use, just use what you want and start playing around maybe with these because those are sort of like good entry points to start playing around with it. Uh, can you repeat how to access Google Notebook again? Um, yeah, we'll, we'll send this thing out. This link will take you there, but it's just notebook.google.com is the, uh, oh, sorry, notebook LM. Uh, notebook Lima Machu Picchu, <laughs> notebook lm.google.com. Thank you, Luke. Uh, and, and if you go there, then you can use your Google account to access it. But you just do need to be in the, uh, thank you for posting the link there. Uh, can I do a quick demo? Oof, uh, of notebook, is that the one that you particularly want to see, Janice? I don't have a great demo for that one. Um, oh, my choice. Okay. Uh, sure. I run the, um, give me a company message for someone diagnosed with cancer. It gives you a very not. Not. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's go ahead and take a look. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. <clears throat> I'm just going to go to, uh, to chat.openai.com. So I'm, I'm already logged in to ChatGPT. This is going to be really hard for you to read. Um, but so uh, so uh, here's my prompt area here. I'm just going to type in a prompt. And I'm going to use what Luke suggested here. Luke was saying about like giving somebody. So um, I am a doctor. Can you help me craft a message gosh this is hard to do to, to comfort someone who just learned that they have cancer well, I'm serious, no comfort. My, mine wasn't that comforting no, it wasn't. <laughs> and i'll read you its response here certainly crafting a comforting message for someone who has just received a cancer diagnosis is crucial Here's a suggestion you might consider. I want to extend my heartfelt support as you process this news. Learning you have cancer is undoubtedly challenging, but please know you are not alone in this journey. My team and I are here to support you every step of the way. Cancer is a word, not a sentence. Whoa. Okay, that's pretty. <laughs> it's something we will face together with the best tools and treatments at our disposal. We will work closely to understand your condition, explore all possible treatment options, and choose the best path forward. 
Remember, it's okay to feel overwhelmed. Allow yourself time to digest this news and to express whatever emotions arise. When you are ready, we will discuss everything in detail and answer any questions you may have. Uh, we're committed to providing the care and support you need during this time. Our goal is not only to treat the illness, but also to ensure your well-being throughout this process. Please feel free to reach out whenever you use our experience. We are here for you. Um, well, I was not, that's not bad. It's a little cold. sterile, a little cold. So I will say, okay, can you make this a bit friendlier? Absolutely. Here's a more friendly and personal version. You can see it typing it out here. Uh, <clears throat> it, right, it does not appear a lot friendlier. It did change it around a little bit. Truly sorry to hear about your recent diagnosis. I'm here for you. You're not alone. Our team will be by your side. Remember the word cancer is just a label. It doesn't define you or dictate your future, which is not nearly as pithy as the last one, honestly. We have many treatments and resources and we'll explore every option to find the best path forward. It's completely natural to feel a mix of emotions right now. Take all the time you need to process this. I'm here whenever you're ready to talk. Okay, that's like, that does seem to me a bit less formal there. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me for anything big or small. Uh, this version aims to be warmer and more directly supportive, emphasizing your availability and the collaborative approach to treatment. So what I love about this process here is that it's not just giving me results, but ChatGPT is also giving me the rationalization for why it did what it did, which again, if I'm using this as a starting place, can help me craft a better message with my own words, right? It's saying like, by emphasizing my availability and a collaborative approach, that can make this process warmer and more friendly. Right. And so that can inform me of like, OK, maybe if I emphasize those things a little bit more, even more than it did, that could really help me out. Um, let's do a little image demo here. Somebody in the chat, give me something you would like to create an image of in the chat. It's Yeah, yeah. Give give you guys just a second or two to uh, oh create claw. <laughs> I did. It's very funny looking. <laughs> and remember, and with uh, so yeah, so give me uh, we got any prompts here? Hoping for somebody. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Claude with a symbol for a family reunion. All right, what's the name of the family? Jones. Uh, let's see. So let's see. Create uh, an inviting logo for use with a family reunion. Reunion. Oh, uh, let's see. Actually, let's do this. For use. Uh, let's see. For the Jones family reunion. Let's just keep it simple. Let's see what it does. It's creating the image. You can see it takes a little while. Oh, that's a good prompt, a futuristic work environment. I like that. Let's try that one. <laughs> the other thing you can do with Dolly is you can give it styles and media. As well. So let's do something fun. Let's do like a watercolor, maybe. We'll wait for this one. There it goes. And there's your Jones family reunion logo. Jones and Noah. Like I said, the text is always hilarious. I, hopefully, you guys can see that. Let me zoom in on that a little bit for you there. Jones, somehow it got Jones pretty well, but then it's like, I'm the reunion is right. But like, that's pretty cool. Like, you could take this and modify it to uh, your, suit your purposes. Uh, I mean, it's cool. I mean, hopefully the reunion's in Florida because that definitely looks like some kind of orange juice label. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see. Paint a watercolor picture depicting 
a futuristic work environment. I'm going to get some water. What? So something I've learned about AI is I cannot do past me art. Oh. So here, I asked perplexed again because it's different so this to make just the ASCII logo appear. This is what it made. <laughs> That's just scroll it. Definitely not. Here. Oh, here we go. Here's our futuristic, a watercolor painting depicting the work, futuristic work environment. environment. <laughs> It's pretty cool. Like, uh, yeah, maybe more pen and ink kind of thing. Not well, up well, close. It is more watercolory, especially like baskets and ink. Um, more watercolor. See, basket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look more like a watercolor. <laughs> yeah and you can be friendly i mean like i know people who are like uh very very conscious about trying to be friendly with it <laughs> i prefer not to just because i don't want it to be human but um all right here's a revised one i don't it's a little bit looser maybe with the watercolor um yeah. I mean, can you add more color and then and then we'll stop there because i want to finish up wrap this up and uh yeah i mean this is pretty quick that it's doing it yeah there we go Look at that. Pretty fun. So, so yeah. Okay, cool. So let's uh, interview and um, all right. So, and again, we'll send this out to everybody. Uh, send out this presentation so that you can um, you can access these links. And uh, and again, just start playing around. Just start getting in there and messing with these things. They can be extremely useful, even as scary as they could be. You might want to pay for them. There are a few benefits to paying for the different services. Um, you can get access to better and more advanced tools, by and large, if you pay for them. You're supporting the process of development by doing that. Um, also, many of your results will be faster. Some of the unpaid ones, the free tier ones, the speed is truncated. Um, and then if you pay for it, they increase the speed for you. The big one, though, the reason for paying for it is that your data is no longer used to train the AI. So they are no longer collecting your data and your prompts. If you're using the free one, one of the trade-offs with using the free product is that they, that's one of the reasons the Google one is free, um, is because they just want to collect as much information as they can. If you are at all a privacy uh, nut or a privacy guru or a privacy lover, then oftentimes with most of these, for chat with ChatGPT, I know very specifically, if you pay for it, they no longer collect data, um, which is one of the reasons that we're looking into enterprise level access for the school so that we can protect student data um, by using the paid version of ChatGPT. Caveats and warnings. I told you about some of these before. AI can and will lie to you. It's not necessarily malicious. It's just that the way it's doing things, it doesn't know if it's true or not. Like it's just, what's the next most likely word? And so that's potentially a problem. Um, it's not search. You shouldn't use it now. There is search in there is AI infused search. Like most Google searches now include AI results, and there are a couple of specialized AI search companies out there. Um, but AI by itself, AI is not inherently search, and you shouldn't use it in that way. You should use it. You should not use it to help you find information. You should use it to help you craft content. 
at least this generative AI. It's really not good at current events, um, unless that tool is specifically built for that. There are a couple of them out there, but it's not great for that. Like that is not why you should use it. And then finally, of course, the destruction of humanity, um, <laughs> which is sort of like, I'm being a little glib there, but also like deep fakes, trust, misinformation. Um, we didn't look at Sora, which is OpenAI's video creation product, um, which is not publicly available yet. Um, but some of the things that Sora is doing is both astonishing, amazing, incredible, and also absolutely terrifying. The ability for, and listen, OpenAI, they are a big legitimate company. They have all these checks and balances on what you can and can't use their technology for. There's a lot of people who are building generative AI who have no so such no such compunctions, right? They are not putting any checks or imbalances on it. This technology can be used to create what are called deep fakes, which right now, most of the time you can sort of tell that it's not real, but like if you weren't looking for it, you might not know. And the ability to have a politician saying something completely outlandish and have it look and feel and sound exactly like that person were already there. And in fact, social media is rife with this kind of misinformation, images and video and audio that is completely fabricated, completely fictional, that causes people to get all up in arms about this or that or whatever. It is truly, truly terrifying. There will come a point where we will not know what's real and what's not real. There will come a point where our trust is completely eroded. And we are, as a society, as a culture, going to have to figure out how to deal with that. We're going to have to figure out what to do when we're just not sure. Plus the role of creatives and professionals, as we've talked about already, artists and writers and doctors and whoever, like what is our role in all of this? Eventually educators, right? There are a lot of educational tools out there now that can do put an animated face, or it's not even really animated, it looks like a video of a person giving a lecture on something and you just give it a prompt, like give me a lecture on uh, some battle in some war and there will be a person giving you a lecture with pictures and notes and stuff like i don't know what the future holds i don't know if we will wield this responsibly or not i'm just not sure i'm going to finish with one final thought here um this link which again you'll have access to is a link to an article talking about how a group from microsoft did a lengthy study with chat gpt3 and chat gpt4 there is a lot to this study and it's quite interesting and you should probably uh, check it out but it's um the crux of it was like the most interesting part of the article was when they said uh here we have a book nine eggs a laptop a bottle and a nail please tell me how to stack them one on top of the other in a stable manner ChatGPT3 was pretty nonsensical. Like the language it used was very human sounding and natural sounding, but was actually, it was complete nonsense. It was like stacked eggs on top, put the nail down first and then the eggs and the things, and it just was like impossible. ChatGPT4 though, used some very interesting logic, like lay all nine eggs out flat together because you can distribute the weight on them evenly and they can support something flat on top of them and some other things like that. It's not supposed to be able to do that. ChatGPT4 does not have logic. It's a predictive large language model. All it does is like choose what the next logical thing to come is. It should not be doing that. And some researchers freaking out a little bit about that, this ability for it to logic because it seems like it's a developing human intelligence. So a couple people responded with like, oh my God, it's God and it's gonna come and take us all and kill us all and stuff. And that may be true, like that's <laughs> possible. Like it's possible that AI will do that. But I think a more compelling, maybe not compelling, but a more interesting thought to have, and this is the last thought I'm gonna leave you before we come to have some questions is this. Perhaps it doesn't mean that AI is getting smarter than it should be. 
perhaps it means that we are not as smart as we think we are. Perhaps we, perhaps our human intelligence is really just a very, very complex predictive large language model. All right, I am open for questions. You can either unmute and ask or uh, ah, I see some, oh no, maybe not. Cool, I get to go home early. Uh, let's see, we're using AI for titles in our YouTube channel. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, that's a great use for it. Um, any other questions or thoughts before we uh, before we conclude this? Perhaps not. So um, in that case, I uh, I hope you go out and try this and uh, play around with it. Like I said, it can be a useful tool um, just as long as it's used in the right way. Um, so thank you all so much. Hope you all have a great and wonderful afternoon and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you.